coral reefs are the most biodiverse ecosystem on our planet. We know that there are so many plants and animals on these reef systems that they are more biodiverse than even the most diverse tropical rainforests. This incredible diversity is also spectacularly beautiful. So a healthy functioning reef not only provides food for local communities, but it provides important areas for those species to survive. And most of those species simply die if they have to leave that reef environment. So they're absolutely essential for maintaining this extraordinary marine biodiversity, for supporting hundreds of millions of people who depend directly on the resources of the reef, and also increasingly important for the rest of the world as incredibly beautiful spots that everyone wants to go and visit just to appreciate the incredible grandeur of nature at its best. When coral reefs are transformed from healthy, vibrant, functioning reefs to wastelands with no living corals and virtually no fish on them, the local communities who depend on those reef systems simply run out of food and other resources and have to either migrate elsewhere or go into poverty. In addition, for the organisms that are totally dependent on a healthy reef environment, most of them end up dying and the few that are able to swim away swim in search of another reef system that they can survive on. So the problem with the death of corals on reef systems is that those corals form the very foundation of the reef and they provide the essential habitats for so much other life on the reef system itself. So that when corals are selectively killed by mass bleaching events, or crown of thorn starfish outbreaks, we know that most of the biodiversity collapses, and in many cases, those reef systems are failing to recover naturally. Coral reefs are important because of many reasons, and uh, the very important in the Philippines, in the Philippine context, is really on the fisheries production. So Philippines is an archipelagic country, and we have a very long coastline. Our coral reefs is approximately 26,000 kilometers and majority are degraded. Coral reefs are very important to, to our lives. So just like the co coastal community here, we rely on the reef for food, for livelihood, tourism, and even coastal protection. So if the reef, if our reefs will be destroyed, it will cause some serious, uh, serious consequences for our lives and our food. The Philippines is known for its coral reefs. It's the center of uh, marine biodiversity. It's, it's the center of the coral triangle. 95% um, of the reefs in the Philippines are degraded um, and more than 80 million Filipinos rely on seafood as a primary source of protein. So it really is, a, it really is a, a, an issue that needs to be addressed for the Philippines. In 2017, I was approached by a nonprofit, uh, Living Planet Aquarium in the US, to do coral reef restoration in the Philippines. Um, we've now done this in five sites, including in Zambales. We took the project to Zambales in 2021, um, initially with the coral fragmentation technique, which is the coral nurseries, where you outplant the broken corals back to the reef. And about six months in, we were approached by the Australian government, and they um, said that they were looking to support marine cons conservation activities in the West Philippine Sea. Uh, we showed them what we were doing, uh, the science and the data behind it, as well as the, you know, the people, the, the most important part. And they were, uh, I guess they were impressed because they said that they wanted to work with us. So they introduced me to Peter Harrison and also to University of the Philippines Marine Science Institute, uh, Dr. Van. And uh, together we came up with a proposal to continue doing what we were doing, we are doing with the coral fragmentation, but also to include Peter's coral spawning restoration technique uh, within our project area. So we, we've, we've taken over the management of a marine protected area in Iba Zambales, and we're undertaking the two techniques of coral reef restoration within the marine protected area. And really trying to show that a properly resourced and managed marine protected area can both have uh, environmental rehabilitation, um, but also help with the, with the fish stocks in the surrounding area and also create livelihoods for the community. The Zambales project is a little unusual in that it's combining the two major types of coral restoration in one project. 
Traditionally, most coral restoration around the world has been done by either using fragmented corals or broken corals, corals of opportunity that have occurred because people have walked on them and broken them or from storms, etc. And then they take those fractured corals and put them into a nursery area, grow them till they're large enough to survive better and then outplant them back onto the reef. That's the more traditional method that's used in many areas around the world. And that's good for small scale restoration processes. The other way and the way that we're focusing on for most of my projects is to capture small amounts of coral spawn slicks, which contain many millions of eggs and sperm, grow many millions of larvae, and then put those larvae back onto the damaged reef areas and the surviving corals that grow from that larval restoration process are much better adapted to those altered environments and therefore more likely to survive and become resilient breeding populations more quickly. So the coral fragmentation technique um, is very effective for rapid reef regeneration, particularly where you've had like an acute weather event or you've got you know, specific damage to specific areas. It does require a lot of dive resources, so it needs people to go there, clean the nurseries, take the data, you know, manually plant the coral back to the reef. Our model in our other locations, so we're in five locations in the Philippines, has been to partner with local dive operators who are obviously invested in protecting the reef, but they also use it as a teaching uh, an immersion technique for, for divers who visit. Zambales is not particularly known for its diving. There's quite a bit of wreck diving in Subic, but we're further up the coast um, and the, there is no established dive operator. So when we wanted to move forward with the project, it became very clear that we, we would have to create this dive resource ourselves. So what we decided to do was to open Finn's Dive, which is owned by the Mead Foundation. So it's a non-profit dive center. So it's offered as a uh, activity for tourists. So it, 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 it has two functions. It supports the project, but it, it also supports the local tourism. It gives people an opportunity to dive, but also to participate in the project. And 100% of the proceeds from that go back into supporting the conservation. And so this is a, an approach that we've taken to give the project um, a degree of economic independence and also longevity. We don't want to just operate a project for a short period of time to match whatever grant funding or other support we've had. And so uh, it's been a really important development and one that's been very successful. What we do for the coral trees is we scout the place where we can like see or find something, uh, a broken pieces of the corals, and then we will hang it there. And then we maintain that one every week. How we maintain the coral tree is we will just like brush the branch, the steam, and then cut the, uh, the, the algae which, which is in their corals so that we can, like the corals are easily getting big. There's a lot of synergies between uh, these types of projects and resorts. The resources required to undertake marine conservation projects are typically uh, similar to the resources required to cater to tourists. And so that's why all around the world, you'll see these kinds of partnership. And I encourage most re all resorts to, do, to try to do the same thing. The coral larval restoration method is relatively simple. It consists of five phases. The first phase is locating healthy breeding coral populations. The second phase is capturing some of the eggs and sperm that they release during these mass spawning events on the reef system. The third phase is transferring that spawn into these floating larval pools that we temporarily moor on the reef. And the larvae develop there for about five or seven days until they're desperate to settle. The fourth phase is delivering those larvae onto the damaged reef areas and letting as many larvae as possible settle to kickstart the recovery of the coral community. And then the fifth and final phase is the monitoring to check on how many of those coral larvae survive and grow over time. There are two ways to rear coral larvae from the reef. So one option is to rear them using floating pontoons in the reef. The second way is to collect them and rear them here in the hatchery. One of their advantages, um, there are advantages in rearing them here in the hatchery. So one is to secure them from different environmental um, issues, such as too much heat, too much, um, um, sometimes 
predation and that's why we reserve this as an option for um, collecting or from, for rearing coral larvae in, here in the hatchery. Um, but for the project, we are actually maximizing the opportunity to rear them in the, in the field. So that's why we set up pontoons or floating pontoons which will rear the larvae for a few days until such time that they are ready to be settled onto the degraded reef areas. Uh, one thing that I didn't realize when I entered into these projects was how little we actually know about marine life in general and corals as well. And by doing these activities, there are some, uh, there's some research being done which will not only benefit the local community, it will actually uh, benefit uh, the whole pool of knowledge that human beings have. Zambales is not really known for its coral reefs. Um, Zambales is more known for its beaches, but it's also known for its mining uh, and previously for its forestry. And so um, there are actually some really pristine reefs in Zambales. Um, there's a marine protected area in Hermana Menor that's properly managed, properly resourced. And this is a prime example of when you give the environment what it needs, it, it, it can really continue to flourish. And so you've got you know, close to 100% coral cover and a really fantastic, pristine reef environment. And so we believe that we can achieve this in other locations in Zambales and beyond. And so this is really what gave us the, the drive and the impetus to, to, to take the project forward. The Zambales Coral Restoration Project is funded by the Australian government through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in the Manila Embassy. And there are many reasons why that funding is important, not only for the Philippines, but also for Australia. It's part of the international goodwill and the ability to exchange scientific knowledge that we can use between Australia and the Philippines. But it also allows us to explore new areas to do these restoration projects. And from that process, we then learn how to do these methods more effectively which can be, in a sense, boomerang research back to Australia, and we can apply that knowledge back to the Great Barrier Reef. Australia is a key partner for the Philippines across maritime issues. And one area where that really matters is working with local communities. So what Australia is doing is working with our partners, including the Mead Foundation and Southern Cross University, to support programs which will help these people, which will help restore coral reefs, which look at the factors that go into the side of both education uh, for future generations and also the technical side, the scientific side, to help regenerate uh, the marine corals. The marine ecology is very important. I mean, it's one of the most devastated or degraded areas in our natural environment. So that's why we're here to try and revitalize and, um, you know, make the reef more alive. So actually, it comes hand in hand also with the livelihood of the fisher folk here. Um, if the corals are healthy, then there will, be, um, there will be habitat for the fish. And then in the long run, we hope to be able to have increased fish catch for them as well. So we're here also to um, try and make sure that the future generations are, are able to appreciate um, the marine environment so that if they have a better appreciation, they'll be able to also properly conserve it. We've had some really interesting outcomes in the Zambales project from this community engagement. And we now have people who are trained to help us and are becoming more and more expert with the larval restoration process, including the point where some of those local community members are now swimming freely on the reef system. And also some of them have learnt to dive. So some dive training has occurred, which would never have been possible without this project. And we're building a great deal of momentum and public understanding, acceptance and interest in the project by deliberately engaging different groups and different important stakeholders in the development of the project. The ultimate aim of the Zambales project is to restore larger areas of reef using both asexual fragmentation and coral gardening outplants, but also millions of coral larvae that are genetically diverse, including heat tolerant corals that are more likely to survive upcoming bleaching events that will inevitably occur as our planet continues to warm. 
What we want to see as an outcome is much larger areas of restored healthy reef systems that are providing habitats for fish, some of which will spill over into other areas nearby that can be used as fish and fisheries resources by the local community, but also for maintaining healthy breeding fish populations on these restored reef habitats. The project's been very successful. Um, we see it as a long-term initiative. Um, initial funding is two years, but we, we, we really plan to continue this forward and also to take the project to other marine protected areas in the Philippines, um, building on the success that we've had in Zambales. Ultimately, the sustainability of these restoration projects is going to be entirely dependent upon the interest and goodwill of the local communities. So it's incredibly important to have as many representatives as possible from these different groups in the local community actively engaged in the project so they understand its importance. They've actually put time and effort into helping us do this restoration and they will own the outcomes in future. So I, I believe that um, now that we have a degraded ecosystem, an interdisciplinary approach towards um, restoring coral reefs uh, is really important. Given the environmental challenges ahead, we cannot solely rely on the governments. Today, we need the participation of every, everybody. So government entities, foundations, private entities and individuals. If anybody is interested in learning more about what we're doing, learning more about coral reef restoration, uh, they can come and visit us, they can dive with us at, at Fins. Um, you can help with the cleaning of the trees or you can just kick around and have fun. But, but knowing that uh, your dive is helping to support the, the conservation of the reef in Zambales.